President Biden is wrapping up his consequential visit to Europe this morning. In the next hour, he is expected to visit an American military cemetery that's near Paris. This event caps a week of ceremonies commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Allied invasion of Normandy. The president has used the stage to call for everyday citizens to defend democracy against authoritarianism worldwide. We stand at an inflection point in history. The decisions we make now will determine the course of our future for decades to come. We have a lot of opportunity, but a lot of responsibility. And it gives me hope to know France and the United States stand together now and always. May we continue to seek democracy. May we, in both our languages, and may we always stay together. Joining us now is professor of history and author of Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, Ruth Ben Ghiat, and presidential historian and professor of history at Bryce University, Douglas Sprinkley. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I, Ruth, I want to start with you because I, I thought this week was an incredibly important week, um, a definitional week, if you will, uh, on both the global stage uh, and here at home for President Biden, in which he, he really connected a number of dots uh, about the urgency of this moment. And the Washington Post, uh, Dana Milbank, um, wrote a piece which I thought sort of captured. He, he talks about uh, the question of will Americans recognize their country in the dark and desperate portrait Trump painted? Mm. Or are our countries failing, uh, uh, falling to pieces, he said. And if he isn't returned to power, the country is finished. You won't have a country anymore. Or... Will Americans instead choose to see a nation still striving to f fulfill the higher purpose that Biden described, in memory of those who fought here, died here, literally saved the world here, let us be worthy of their sacrifice? That, to me, was just a, 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 a consummating moment. Uh, I would love to get your take on how the president has framed this visit, uh, visit around this idea of there's a bigger fight uh, out there. Those who've come before have engaged in it. Now it's up to us to, to really engage as well for, on behalf of democracy. I think it's been extremely uh, effective to frame this, not only because the, the, the reason he's there is commemorating, you know, an important victory over fascism in World War II, but it reminds us of the toll that bad leadership can have, and not just on one's own country, but on the world. When you have destructive, dysfunctional, vengeful leaders uh, with large armies, as you did with Mussolini, with Hitler, uh, and today with Putin, you see that uh, the world is not safer. Trump is trying to tell us that the world will be safer if he's there because he's allied uh, with people like Putin and Xi, but that's not the case, and history is very clear on that. Douglas, I want to agree with Michael that this week was, in his word, definitional, right? And I thought when you were listening to President Biden abroad that he was both expressing the urgency of this moment that we find ourselves in, but with an eye toward history. There were many rhetorical flourishes where he, where he would say, how will we be remembered? How will this moment be remembered in 10, 20, 30 years. Do you agree that this week was definitional? And when we look back, when scholars of history look back at this moment, how will this week and this trip be remembered? Well, on the short term, it was a, a, a big win for Joe Biden. I mean, he went to Point to Hawk, the famous spot where Ronald Reagan gave one of his greatest speeches. And, and pulled off a, a, a very important speech, uh, warning us about the need for democracy and, and the need to fight for freedom, reminding us that authoritarianism is on the loose yet again. Um, you know, really going after, and you know, mild language in some ways, but going after people that were are xenophobic, nativists. Mm -hmm. well, there is a right-wing populist movement blooming in Europe right now. So Biden did come across as representing um, America as a statesman and promoting NATO and and uh, protecting the Ukraine and really trying to create a stronger bulwark against Putin's Russia, who is on an expansionary terror right now. You know, uh, to follow up on that point, um, Douglas, you know, I believe it was uh, 
Cass Mudd that once wrote that populism is a, a, a thick ideology that's always mixed with a thin ideology. And so this right-wing <laughs> populism that is on the rise in Europe, it, populism doesn't always have to be bad. But I would argue, like Bernie Sanders was a, is an economic populist, right? But this idea that this... This, this dirty populism, for lack of a better term, is the thing that is taking hold in places, not just across Europe, but there's a sentiment like that right here at home. How does that dovetail with what we know to be true about our history? Well, you see the Republican Party of today um, going back to the 1930s and embracing a isolationist plank. Uh, they are the Henry Fords and Charles Lindberghs of today. Um, this is usually a fringe movement, but isolationism uh, certainly over the decades has had its uh, adherence. Uh, what's scary about it, what's worrying about it, is this friendship that um, uh, President Trump has maintained with Putin. I mean, he acts like, you know, um, he's Putin's puppet, as Hillary Clinton famously put it. And he, he does acts that way any, with any authoritarian leader. If you chisel away at what Donald Trump is arguing, he really sees a world of five big powers with five uh, important author, authoritarian slash, in, in his case, Democratic leader. And um, we don't do business that way in the United States. Uh, Trump is standing out as on a as a lone silo because all the other presidents. I mean, Ronald Reagan was in the news because of the spot uh, Biden chose to give his Normandy commemorative speech. Uh, Reagan's part of the other presidents club. I uh, meaning Ronald Reagan would want to make sure that we defended Ukraine. That whole speech Reagan gave in 1984 was about liberating Eastern Europe and was getting the Soviet, uh, the Berlin Wall to come down and breaking up the Soviet Union and America democracy on an offensive posture. And Trump is really simply an agent of fear. He's fear-mongering the way Huey Long did in America or Father Coughlin. Um, you know, you get the uh, Joe McCarthy famously. What's different is they have, we've had those those tenets before of fear-mongering writ large, but they never went all the way to somebody being able to take over the party of Abraham Lincoln. And um, and also with the specter that January 6th has happened, and this many millions of Americans seem to shrug off January 6th as not a big deal, to me is frightening, and it tells you just how deeply rooted uh, social media has made right-wing extremism um, a disease across our land right now. So, so, Ruth, given everything that we know um, and certainly that we've learned from history and historians like Douglas, how did we get here? How do, how do we how do people move themselves into this space? Because I, the reason I ask is I'm going to I want to play for you uh, the new uh, bot ad from the Biden campaign, which lays out some of the uh, more infamous quotes of Donald Trump and, and military service, for example. Let's take a look. He handed me his Purple Heart. I always wanted to get the Purple Heart. <laughs> this was much easier. Does, Don, does Donald Trump even understand why someone is given a Purple Heart, why they receive a Purple Heart in the first place? And so here we are uh, in this moment where people are looking past the, the guy's attack, this man's attack on the military, his attack on institutions, his attack on the Constitution. What, what do you sense is going on that's animating this and allowing it to continue the way it has? Um, I'm really glad that the Biden campaign made that ad. It's very moving because it speaks to the heart. It gets to the heart of the fact that authoritarians are nihilists. They have no ideals beyond money and power. And they can't, uh, anybody who would do something like uh, serve their country knowing they may be injured or killed, that makes them losers and dupes, which are the and suckers, which are the words that Donald Trump uses about 
uh, our own people who serve, and he mocks people who serve, such as Nikki Haley's husband. And but this is it. This is. Um, in keeping with authoritarians throughout history because they uh, really despise the people they, quote, govern. And they only want to dominate them, exploit them. And so this is why I go back to character and leadership. And having somebody like Donald Trump uh, lead our country, we deserve better. It is a, an incredible moment, D Douglas, to, to be living in, right? And. And um, I think about President Biden on the world stage. Uh, yesterday, we were on air. We came on air. We were prepared to talk about the president's trip to Europe. In the interim, there was the hostage rescue out of Gaza. I want you to take a listen to what the president had to say. I want to echo President Macron's comments welcoming the safe rescue of four hostages that were returned to their families in Israel. We won't stop working until all the hostages come home and a ceasefire is reached. That is essential to happen. I tell you, Douglas, so often when I see these moments on the world stage, I, I'm reminded of the argument that President Biden made when he was running um, for president four years ago, which was, we need someone who day one is ready to hit the ground running, who understands challenges at home and challenges abroad. He really foreshadowed the years that would come in terms of the myriad crises that have developed in real time. Well, when I was watching President Biden these last few days, I'm reminded um, of his greatness. You know, often we we dismiss something that he says or that he seems to be uh, fumble an opportunity. But there's this sort of steady evenness about him, even a low keelness which may not make him kinetic on the campaign trail, but it sure does make you feel well or, or, or at least sane that he is a statesperson, that he understands protocol, that he understands how important the U.S.-French relationship is, that he could go back and talk about uh, Lafayette with Marcone and understand the whole story of the American Revolution up to today with France. Uh, he's been there. He's done that. He, he's seen a lot. And he was visibly moved at Normandy when he went into that forest of crosses and, and um, you know, uh, uh, stars of David and walked across there. You can feel how emotional this was. After all, Biden had been born in World War in 1941, uh, probably be our last president um, coming right now. That would be a World War II president. And he, he reminded us of the power of NATO, that this has been the essential alliance since 1945, you know, really 48 with Harry Truman, all the way up to now. And there's only been one anti-Truman, anti-NATO president, and that's Donald Trump. NATO, the Atlantic Alliance, is seminal for keeping the um, our military, um, economic policies, and democracy, and culture even, shared Atlantic culture, alive and well. And I've been deeply disturbed the way Trump's kind of shunted aside NATO as if it's unimportant, almost acts Trump like the European Union, she might as well just blow away. Uh, and so it's refreshing to, uh, to watch um, Biden and know that he has that long institutional memory and understands what containment of Soviet expansion means back in the George Kennan, Paul Nitsa days way.